Thanks for tuning in to Retire Hour, the weekly show discussing income planning, investing, tax planning, estate planning, and Medicare. Complete retirement education. Hear from our financial advisors, CPA, estate planning attorney, and Medicare advisor every week. Welcome to Retire Hour. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Retire Hour. Thanks for tuning in this week, whether you're watching on TV or any of the 18 plus different radio stations across Kansas and Missouri. The weekly show that helps you stay up to date on the ever changing landscape that is retirement. And boys and girls out there, if you've got not been t- paying attention to this Build Back Better legislation that the House passed just a week or so ago, you need to be paying attention to it because there's some big changes in there. And it's it's not finalized, but it tells you that they're they're paying attention to some things and they want it on their radar. And yes, it might not pertain to everyone, but it's important to be following it because it is something that is evolving and I think it will continue to evolve. And we're going to talk about that on the show this week. Also, we have a listener question coming up. Don't forget to go online to uh, retirehour.com and submit your listener question there. If you give us your physical mailing address, we'd love to send you out one of these Retire Hour coffee mugs as well. We're sending out a couple this week because you guys can follow the directions out there and provide us with your uh, mailing address. Again, we love to share those with you. In our estate planning segment, we have a listener question from Jeff about he is a beneficiary from an inheritance, but it's not quite moving along quite the way he thought. So you'll want to stay tuned for that later in the show. Also with our tax professional, Joshua Sakura, our lead CPA with Market Tax Services, he'll be talking about, again, the, the, the retirement impacts and changes that have been proposed in this legislation that's passed the House already. And maybe what a backdoor Roth conversion is. And we'll be talking about that again more this morning. So also with me here, I've got in studio Danny Goolsby, an advisor with Market Advisor Group Wichita. Coming from their offices there in Wichita, I've got Larry Clefcorn, an advisor with Market Advisor Group Wichita. And then coming from their offices in Kansas City, Missouri, I've got Jonathan McCoy, an advisor with Market Advisor Group Kansas City, coming up there from his offices in the Northland. So guys, again, with this Build Back Better bill that the House passed, yes, it's not final. Yes, that's kind of maybe uncertain where it is in the Senate, but I think it's important to start letting our our listeners and viewers know about this because uh, now is the time to start planning with this, not after the fact. So important to see how they're changing things with the Roth IRA. And, And if you don't know what a Roth IRA is, it's a very different kind of retirement account versus a traditional IRA. It's more a tax favored account that has some great benefits to it, doesn't impact the taxation on your social security. You're not forced to take a withdrawal at a certain age, 70 and a half or 72. It doesn't impact what you'll pay for your Medicare premiums with what's called IRMA, income related monthly adjustment amount. It also isn't taxable to your heirs. So there's a lot of interesting things that, and, and, and beneficial things with a Roth, but it takes time and planning. And, and really we believe it takes a tax team and a financial advisor team to implement those strategies effectively. This current bill includes some versions and and some uh, revisions to some retirement provisions here. And we're going to talk about these four. We're going to talk about two here. And then after the break, we'll talk about the other two. Larry, the first provision here, it won't impact a lot of people, but but really, what is it? Well, the first um, limitation on future traditional IRA or Roth IRAs, contributions, Okay, so the first tax uh, or four taxpayers whose IRAs and defined contribution plans exceed $10 million and whose income exceeds $450,000 annually for married filing joint or $400,000 for those uh, that are single. This new provision is not slated to go into effect till after December 31st. 2028, but those levels are phased out where you can no longer participate. So not everyone has $10 million in their retirement accounts, but I I think it's important to start calling attention to these because I I mean, take the income tax, for example, I think the income tax came out in 1914. The top tax rate back then was 7%. And you know, the top tax rate today is a little more than 7%. And it kind of reminds me of the guy that said uh, he'd given a, or that he was working on his second million dollars because he gave up on his first million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when, when they're looking at introducing these regulations, I hear from people oftentimes, well, you know, they're, they're going to do away with the Roth or they'll just tax the Roth one day. Even if that's true, they're, they're phasing it out, like you mentioned, and it doesn't really 
come into effect until the year 2029. So this is something that, uh, again, isn't going to impact a lot of people. But when the income tax system came out, it didn't impact a lot of people as well. They just kind of kept moving the line once they create that line in the sand. So Jonathan McCoy up there in Kansas City, this second provision here, it, it creates I'm going to call it a new RMD. That's not third language, but it, it it makes people take money out if they get to a certain level, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And I'm thinking, you know, we're always looking forward for planning for people, not looking at what's existing today. Like you said, Matt, we can't just be planning around what's happening today. We have to be looking forward to these potential changes. So if a lot of these changes don't go into effect until 2028, if you've got, for example, and not everybody has $5 million, but if you had $5 million in a tax-deferred retirement account today, Seven years from now, it's only going to take about a 10% per year rate of return for you to have a $10 million um, nest egg there in a 401k or an IRA, whatever type of account that may be, as long as it's pre-tax. So if your dollar values in these accounts are exceeding that $10 million level, say you've got $10,500,000 in an IRA come 2020, 2029, we'll call it. Well, that additional five hundred thousand dollars, you're going to have to take two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in additional taxable income if it's from an IRA or four hundred one k to get back down closer to those levels that Congress is trying to cap these tax deferred retirement account at, re- retirement accounts at. So, just thinking a little more proactively forward about how these changes are going to impact you. If you're a higher income earner, four hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars or above as a household, or if throughout the course of your career you may approach closer to around ten million dollars in tax deferred assets, it's important to be planning ahead for this because you could really be hammered in retirement if you're thinking you're going to have a tax advantage by having a potentially lower income in retirement. And then Congress is telling you that you've got to, you're going to be forced to take more taxable income than you thought. And these tax benefits we're planning for today may not actually help you. Well, and I want to, yeah, you you bring up some good points there, especially um, you don't have to have 10 million today (laughs) and everyone hopes they have more money in the future, right? But uh, this this fifty percent distribution on when their their assets get above the ten million dollar threshold that it just requires them to take whatever is above out of there out. Um, I'm I'm calling that a new RMD or a new kind of RMD required minimum distribution. Uh, I think it's just interesting to point out that these income limits and these these asset limits um, are just a starting point. And if they introduce it now and it takes effect in 2029, doesn't mean they can't lower it between now and then, because we know taxes are going up in the future. And if you're not working with a team that's capable of handling that, as far as from a planning strategy, you're going to get caught by surprise. So Danny, all these provisions, I think it's interesting because they would become effective starting, like I mentioned, the year 2029. We often hear people say, you know, well, they'll just change the Roths to be taxable. So I don't need to do it. I, I truly think that's a scapegoat from, from advisors that they, they work with that can't give tax advice. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I agree. It's, you know, if you think of any particular job you're trying to do, whether it's in your employment or at home, some particular task you're trying to do, if you don't have the right tool to get that job done, then you're going to be less efficient, less effective at getting the job done. Uh, so those advisors who aren't qualified to give tax advice, uh, they don't have the proper tools in their arsenal. We feel like they can actually be harming their clients more than they could be helping them. That's absolutely true. So if you want to work with a team that has the tax department in-house with the estate planning department and the Medicare team, reach out and have a conversation with us. 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687, or go to our website, retirehour.com. You can book a consultation right there. It's easy. Just have a phone conversation in any of our offices across Kansas and Missouri. Well, stay tuned because we'll continue this conversation and talk about two more provisions that could impact your retirement in the future. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. Continuing this conversation on what's in the Build Back Better bill as far as impacts to people's retirement accounts. Going to go here to Larry Clefcorn in Wichita, Kansas. Backdoor Roth conversions would no longer be allowed. But first, what is a backdoor Roth conversion? Because I actually know of, of someone that you help and, and, and your office is there with your tax team actually execute a backdoor Roth conversion. Right. Yes. Um, a backdoor Roth is if your income is above a certain level, then if you contribute to an IRA, uh, it phases out your deductibility of that. So in other words, the levels are uh, 
married filing joint, if your income is over 105000 it starts to phase out. And by the time you get to $125,000 of income, then it totally phases out. So what people have done in using the backdoor Roth is go ahead and contribute to those IRAs, even though they can't get the tax d- deductibility on them. So they're putting their money in with money they've already paid taxes on, but then they convert that money over to a Roth. Well, since they didn't uh, get a deduction on it in the first place, they are, they don't owe any taxes on the conversion. Okay. And so uh, that is the back door and it's kind of prickly to tell you the truth. I've found out working with market tax services and the team there that uh, and actually is, is counted pro rata as it comes out of the IRA. That's a whole nother subject. Yeah. Joshua, our lead CPA that's going to be on later in the show with market tax services, he's going to talk more in detail about that and how it kind of caught someone off guard uh, that you guys came across that was working with an advisor that didn't have the tax department there to do it. Jonathan McCoy in Kansas City. So what does the provision limit or, or disallow with this backdoor Roth conversion? Yeah, so the saying strictly, we talked about those income limitations um, for some of the Roth options that we talked about in the first segment, uh, $450,000 for married filing joint or $400,000 if you file single. But what they're saying is this provision uh, is not going to go into effect until December 31st of 2032. So there is still some runway to be able to execute some of these backdoor Roth conversions and Roth conversions in general. Uh, I think it's, it's key to, as we talked about before, Keep an eye forward on how these changes are going to be evolving and how they might impact your tax management situation. But as you mentioned in the first segment, Matt, if you're working with an advisor that cannot execute a tax management plan because they don't have a tax professional or a tax advisor uh, and the team like what we have at Market Tax Services alongside us here at Market Advisory Group, a lot of those advisors are going to say, you know, you don't need, they're never, first of all, never bring up a backdoor Roth and some of these more sophisticated tax management plans because they're not licensed to do so. So if, if you're talking to an advisor and you have questions about a backdoor Roth and they have no answers or they tell you to go talk to another CPA or tax, talk to your tax professional and you don't have a tax professional, give us a call. Uh, reach out to us at retirehour.com or reach out to us at the phone number and, and we'll set up a meeting, set up a meeting with our tax team to analyze whether or not uh, a backdoor Roth conversion strategy may be beneficial to you. I've worked with numerous clients on this strategy. Uh, with the help of our CPAs through market tax services. And and it really can provide some significant tax savings in the long run. Yeah. The, the, your lead CPA there in Kansas city is Pat, and he does a great job working with you to make sure you guys are working as a team and in one room at the same conference table to make sure you're executing these, uh, uh, I'm going to call them advanced strategies. And don't get me wrong. I mean, any advisor out there can help you with your investments and investments are a key important part to your retirement. But if you're not working with a team that can help you stay up to date on the changing tax laws and folks, they're going to be changing more and more rapidly as either administrations change, Congress changes, or they just need more money in general. You guys, you know when you're going to find out about this? When you file your taxes or when you find out it's too late. And that's not the time to be doing something about it. You have to be working with a team under one roof together. And that's what we do here. And it doesn't, it doesn't cost our clients any more money. Uh, than than if they're working with typically a a financial advisor. But finally, Danny here, the bill does ban super Roth conversions. I'm seeing a theme here. They're going after more wealthy, affluent people, and no one normally considers them wealthy or affluent, and they're just going to keep moving this line, I feel like. What's the limits on incomes? And as long as the, the, the individual's income doesn't exceed a certain limit, they can still do these, right? And the answer is yes, uh, but to answer your question, the limits as the bill sets right now, because it's not a complete bill or it's not it's not signed in signed yet, but the limits are is for a super Roth is as a married income. If your income is more than four hundred and fifty thousand, then you're then you're excluded. As a single income earner, if your income is more than four hundred thousand, you're excluded. So uh, again. These seem way out of reach for a lot of people, but according to a Forbes Hour article that, that I just uh, read earlier, or earlier today, it said that the uh, BBB legislation, I can't say that. You know, Build back it, better. Well, you know, that's like rubber baby bug, buggy <laughs> bumpers. So, but the BBB legislation packs another double whammy specifically for Roth accounts. And this is, Jonathan cited 2032, way out there. 
but this is actually 2022. The bill proposes to end the so-called non-deductible backdoor and mega backdoor Roth conversions. So regardless of the income level, you no longer are able to convert after-tax contributions to a 401k or a traditional IRA or Roth IRA. So, uh, and then another part of that, that article, it said, um, a quick glance at the, at the latest IRS data tells the story. Among more than 200 million U.S. tax filers, fewer than three-fourths of one, of one million, so less than 750,000 people, did a Roth conversion in the year 20, 2018. So that's roughly 60% of those conversions were carried out by households that made between one hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000, which is more of us. Now, it's, again, we all aspire to have more money and more, in, and more assets, but as the bill sets right now, they're, they're, it seems a long ways out for, for a lot of us in, in this uh, culture, but it's actually, they're coming for us. And if you ask um, our lead CPAs at Market Tax Services, they would probably say that half those Roth conversions were done with Market Tax Services. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> or maybe they feel like it because yeah. they're so busy with that. You know, I, I want to point out these income limits. Um, I was with one of our CPAs the other day, about two weeks ago, doing a Roth conversion with a client. They have $2 million in their IRA, and they've still got a lot of time before they reach their RMD age, 72. Say that doubles to $4 million dollars. That RMD is more than $140,000 as it stands today. And some of these people that you're referencing don't need that extra income, but it doesn't matter. So we worked as a team together going back and forth, looking through the numbers, and we did a $200,000 Roth conversion. And that sounds like a lot, but we're trying to lower that future tax liability. And it can be done if you guys are working with a team that has a CPA there at the same table and the financial advisor. Feel free to reach out and give us a call and see what we can do for you. 833 888 H-O-U-R, or that's 833-888-4687, or go to our website, retirehour.com. Submit your question there, or just feel free to reach out, or even book your consultation right there on the website. Well, stay tuned, because we'll be right back with a listener question, a question from Rhonda. You won't want to miss this. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone, to Retire Hour, the show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape in retirement. And we've been talking now about the changes that have been proposed in this bill here, but we have a listener question. I want to get to that. It was submitted on our website, and you can do this too. Go out there to retirehour.com. The question goes, we have over $900,000 in our 401k. My husband is 60 years old, still working, and we are concerned about the government causing a stock market crash and losing it. Do you have any advice? Should we roll over to an IRA or buy precious metals? We want to buy a house here, but the housing market is is not good right now. We own our home and it's paid for. Any advice would be helpful. Signed, Rhonda. So I'm going to go to Jonathan McCoy in Kansas City. Jonathan, what advice would you have for Rhonda and her husband in this situation? Well, I mean, our process obviously is, is typically sit down with someone to get to know their situation a little bit better. I would say take a close look at what kind of future income they're going to be needing once her and her husband are both retired. But I'm finding, I'm, I'm kind of getting the feeling with Rhonda that her more specific concern is that they are at the mercy of the market right now. And that's a big concern that most of the people that we talk to and that we help with, our clients are concerned that they've spent their entire working careers building these nest eggs. And maybe shortly before they decide to retire, a lot like what people had to go through in 2008, the market just cuts them out, uh, cuts their knees out from under them uh, from a financial standpoint. So. When you're in a buy and hold strategy, when you're dealing with a lot of these large 401k custodian companies, there's not a lot of advice there. And the idea is just buy and hold, let the money run, let the market do what it's going to do. In your earlier years working while you're still contributing and you still have a number of years left before retirement, that strategy can actually work. But what we focus on here at Market Advisor Group is a much more tactical approach so that there is uh, more of a safety net put in place. We have a more, much more predictable worst case scenario that allows you to ride through the downturns in the market and still provide yourself the income that you're going to need in retirement. So in Rhonda's case, I would say first, talk to an advisor and, and our, our doors are always open, but talk to us one on one about what type of more proactive strategy can be put in place before the next market crisis happens. And I know that Danny and Larry may touch on this a little bit, but We've also got to be very careful when we start talking about precious metals. A lot of folks that have invested in that area of the market for the last 10 to 15 years have made absolutely zero return. So when you think of, you know, that, you know, people talk about that being an inflation protection and different things, you got to be really careful about holstering your entire 
uh, retirement assets to a single asset class like precious metals or any other area of the market for that reason. Yeah, Larry, real quick here, what advice would you give Rhonda and her husband? Well, I would certainly want to protect what I've spent a lifetime and a, a career at saving. And um, that's one of the areas where the retirement red zone is a factor. Uh, five years before you retire and five years after you retire, those are the most important times. It's always important to protect your money, but those are the most important time to protect your money because it could have an effect on you for the rest of your retirement. Yeah, that's so true. And then we've seen with this new variant, and then folks, there's always going to be a new variant. There's always going to be something that, that adds all these up and downs. We've seen kind of some wild rides in the stock market the past couple of weeks, haven't we, Danny? Oh, man, it, volatility has really increased, yes. Um, you know, I may tell Rhonda, uh, there's a lot to her question. She has several different points there, all rolled up into one. Whether you're talking about the real estate market, you're talking about the precious metal market, specifically the stock market, there, the volatility, as you said, or as you referenced, has really increased recently. And the speed dumps for the stock market, you know, the, that's Congress with a debt ceiling crisis. Uh, that's the Federal Reserve Chair, or not, yeah, the Jerome Powell, talking about tapering and, and uh, speeding up or accelerating the tapering process faster than, than initially said, talking about maybe raising interest rates faster than they wanted, wanted to. Inflation's kind of run, going hyperinflation, and it's out of control. It's supposed to be transitory, but it's not. Well, yeah, he said he's going to stop using that word. This yeah, week. right, exactly. That's no longer a good word to use. So, And then tax increases. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot to that question. And so um, what I would encourage Rhonda to do is plug into some uh, to a team of people which are each qualified to speak into each sector of that uh, that's going to affect them as retirees. Yeah, and if you guys want to have a conversation with us about the team approach, feel free to reach out to us at 833 833- 888-H-O-U-R, or that's 833-888-4687, or go to our website, retirehour.com. And folks, you can't just set it and forget it in retirement. Laws will change, the economy will change, your situation will change, and you want to make sure you're working with a complete team that's going to help you with this whole approach. Well, after the break, we'll be back with our Medicare advisor talking about retired federal employees. They have some certain options that are available to them for their Medicare uh, coverage. And then Gerald Eidelman, our estate planning attorney, will talk about with the listener question from Jeff about the inheritance that's not quite moving along as fast as possible. And then we'll finish it out with Joshua Sakura, CPA from Market Tax Services, about, again, these changes that are being proposed in this House bill. Stay tuned and don't forget to go to retirehour.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby, the show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement. We appreciate you guys tuning in every week. If you miss an episode, you can go to our website at retirehour.com, subscribe to our podcast. We've got a lot of podcast subscribers. We appreciate that as well. And then our YouTube channel, don't forget that. We like to put out little clips of the show. If you don't have a whole hour, you can go catch a five-minute episode. We put those out every week. You can thank Laban for that. and appreciate that, Laban on your hard work there, clipping down the show from an hour to five minutes. So in studio here, you you don't want to listen to the whole show for an hour, Bill. (laughs) (laughs) Five minutes. That's, that's really clipping it down. It is. It is. So, but uh, in studio with me, I've got our lead advisor with market Medicare advisors, Bill Vodder. And you know, you and I were actually, I was in an appointment the other day and, and I had someone that had a question. He was actually a postal worker and he was retiring. And he said, well, um, he said, I don't, I don't need to enroll in Part B because I've, I've got my, my federal benefits. And that's not necessarily true, right? No, that is not true. He they, needs to enroll in that Part B, right. right? They are expected to take Medicare at that time. So it was great being able to walk down the hall and either grab you or Corey or any of your team and have him get answers right then to those questions. Not say, well, I've got someone I can refer you to, or I've got someone that you, know, I, you can call, or you know, I, I don't really handle Medicare um, you'll have to go somewhere else. It's just that beneficial approach of working here all under one roof. And now you started having a conversation with him that he has to take that Part B. And I maybe we need to mention here Part B is going up next year. Uh, it, yes, it, it's one hundred forty-eight fifty this year. And what's it going to next year? One hundred and seventy dollars and ten cents. That's a pretty big jump. That is the largest increase I have ever seen. And you know they had a cost of living increase of five point nine percent. On Social Security. On Social Security, but 
gosh, that is a, that's a, I don't even know the percentage on that, but that's a much bigger percentage increase than 5.9%. Someone said, I, ha- I haven't figured it. Somebody said it was about a 14% increase. And I read somewhere that it has to do with maybe some of the impacts of the pandemic. And then also there's a new Alzheimer's drug that they're thinking they might have to cover and they're having to spread that cost around everyone. I mean, so there's, there's all kinds of probably reasons of why it went into there, but. And I, I don't suppose inflation had anything to do with it. Uh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> this week, he, the, the Fed chair did say it's not transitory. We're going to retire that word. Uh, no pun intended there, retire. But back to this postal worker. So postal workers, federal government employees, they have some plans that are available to them that not the general public has access That's to. That's right. Retired federal employees have access. I, I've lost track of it over the years, but you, last I knew it was two or three or four different plans that they can pick from during their open enrollment period to move from one company to another, one plan to another. But there was a time back early in my career when, when people would retire, the federal employees would retire and they would have access to these retirement plans. And we would always tell them, hang on to that plan because you can't, you can't do better than that on the open market. But part of that had to do with back then they had some prescription drug coverage. They had maybe had some dental in there. They had they had benefits that the that today's Medicare didn't have. I mean, today's Medicare is different than it was twenty thirty years ago. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I mean, you've been doing this since the eighties, right? I mean, since nineteen eighty four. I'm not gonna. I was gonna let you do, do that. So, <laughs> but so back to these plans and in. So maybe they've heard through retired coworkers or maybe coworkers themselves, don't let go of that. It's the best. It's the best. And it's it's probably I don't want to say pigeonholed, but it's it's put them in this predicament where they don't even look to see if there's anything else out there that's more competitive. Right. So t- today we there's a lot of people that work past age sixty five. I mean, a lot of people are these days. And and they have their group insurance. Well, so now they have the choice of either hanging on to that group insurance or letting go of that and taking Medicare. And I always encourage people to weigh it out. Take a look at the cost and the benefits of the group insurance and weigh that against the cost and the benefits of the Medicare insurance. Some people, you know, I had a lady in yesterday. I mean, she pays like an average of about $92 a month for her health insurance. I mean, her and her and it's really good coverage. And it's like, you need to hang on to that group for it until you're ready to retire. But then there's other people that their group insurance isn't that strong. And it's actually cheaper for them to let go of it and take Medicare and, and end up with better benefits. So you, you just have to weigh it out. Now, coming back to the federal, those folks need now to weigh it out because today's Medicare is different than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And so these plans they're talking about they're supplement plans, right? They're, so they're Medicare supplement plans that are offered? Not, they don't necessarily work exactly as a supplement plan. Now, for instance, Medicare Part B generally covers 80% of, the, of what they approve of on the bill, leaving the other 20%. And some of those group plans will cover 80% of the 20%. So that, you know, that's not working like a Medicare supplement. It still picks up most of the cost. But then if you take a look at what you're paying in premium for that benefit, then sometimes it's really not worth it. And it all comes down to the individual scenario. I mean, yes. and, you, and you and your team do a fantastic job of working people through, well, tell us what's going on. What medications are you on? What doctors are you seeing? What's your current plan? Well, let's go see if there's anything better. I mean, and you, you guys, I have to commend you guys. You really do a great job. And you take a load off of us as financial advisors because- Medicare is its own animal outright. I right. Mean, and, it you, is. and it changes and, and there's so many details that you have to pay attention to. And I don't understand. There are advisors out there that try and do the investments and the Medicare side. And I, 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 I well, would go crazy. And those advisors are probably only telling them about one side of Medicare, the side that they don't have to get recertified for retrained for every year. There's, there's that version of Medicare and they will push it every time. So when you were helping this postal worker walk through his options, uh, did he look at anything else and did it kind of open his eyes to maybe it see? It did open his eyes, and he is giving it some thought. He, he realized that there is another world out there, and he does have options now. Whereas, like I say, 20 or 30 years ago, they really, in my view, they didn't have an option. They needed to hang on to their group insurance. But 
but I don't, I don't stick to that today. The only thing constant is change, right? That's right. So if you guys want to have a conversation, feel free to reach out to our Medicare team, 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687, or just shoot us an email there at askretirehour.com. We would be love, uh, we'd be happy and love to have a conversation with you about your options probably after open enrollment, right? Yeah. You guys you know, are just, you guys it doesn't are cost anything to come talk to That's us. Right. So why not talk to us? That's right. And we actually had a couple drive down from St. Joe, Missouri to Wichita, Kansas to talk to you guys. That's right. Yeah. So made my day. <laughs> if you guys are listening, we want to give a shout out to you guys. Thanks for coming down. Well, we'll be right back with our estate planning attorney, Gerald Eidelman, and that listener question from Jeff. You won't want to miss this about inheritances. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby. In this segment, we'll be talking with our estate planning attorney, Gerald Eidelman, and we have a listener question that someone submitted off our website, retirehour.com. And because Jeff included his address, we're mailing him out this Retire Hour coffee mug. Thank you, Jeff, for your question. We appreciate you listening every week to the show. So the question goes, my father remarried years ago and has since passed away. My stepmother recently passed away this year, and I remember they had a trust. I've learned my stepbrother is the trustee, and since she passed away in June, I have still yet to receive any of my inheritance. What should I do? So what would you maybe recommend uh, in this situation, but maybe what should have been done from the get-go so that they wouldn't be in this situation? Well, you know, uh, this is a difficult decision for some people, but I normally recommend that people have a family meeting once the documents are done, you know, whether it be when everybody's home at Christmas or Thanksgiving, and sort of run down everybody through what you have made as a state plan. And if possible, uh, also give each one of your beneficiaries a copy of their docu- of the documents. Now, not everybody's going to follow this because they want to keep things secretive or they feel uncomfortable sharing with their children. So there's going to be many occasions where this is not followed. But I highly encourage that. That's the beginning of uh, solving some problems. Now, whether they have the trust or or just a, a will or anything else in between, and then powers of attorney, financial, medical, all right. those things. Because really when you need these or when they're going to come into play – you're probably not a hundred percent, right? No, usually are not. And you know what I, I tell I, I tell my clients that, and I give them copies as well to hand out to their powers of attorney, so that they can have them now and not have to dig through their documents later when an emergency comes up. And so this gentleman, uh, uh, Jeff, if, if he comes to you, what are his options? Does he have legal? I mean, everyone has legal options, but you don't want to get Right, with that. right. Now, one of the things that I, I, I didn't mention before, and that is that also the grantor, the person who sets up the trust, really needs to talk to the persons who are going to be a trustee and explain to them what they're leaving behind to them. Because some people get appointed trustees, don't know about them, and they get handed a bowl of wax that they don't want to deal with. Right. That is a duty. That is yes. a pretty big task. Absolutely. And that's... Part of the situation with Jeff, what happens is that a trustee is a fiduciary. That means that ha- that that individual has responsibility to act in the best interest of the beneficiary, which means investing the money in the best interest of the beneficiaries according to the trust. Uh, you know, using the prudent investor rule uh, and making sure that the trust and assets are making money. Uh, sufficient to meet the obligations that the trust has set out. Um, And because of that, the trustee has an obligation to notify all of the beneficiaries once the grantor dies and they become uh, the current beneficiaries. A a, A trustee should give each beneficiary a copy of the trust in accounting of what the actual uh, value of the assets are in the trust and how, and that way you know what's there and how it's going to be distributed. Uh, Part of the difficulty, I think, with Jeff is also that, 
He's, he's saying that his uh, um, stepmother died in June. Well, that may not have given enough time to the trustee to gather all the assets and put things together if it's a large estate. Sure. I mean, so June, this is now December. I mean, that's, you know, depending on when it was in June, that could be five, six months. I mean, right. that does sound like a long period of time. But as I think, I think, you know, some people might look at it from the fact of, if there's taxable implications, that's something you kind of need to you know for planning purposes. Oh, absolutely. If there's any income held up in the trust, that's going to become taxable to the trust, which it's not beneficial if it's more than a certain amount of money because the tax rate for trust uh, a, a, a increases exponentially after, th after a certain amount of money. So if the trust makes more than $13,000, each dollar after that is taxed at the highest rate, which is 32%. Oh, 37%. You're right. Yeah. Th excuse me, 37%. So um, uh, that's why we have tax professionals that we work with here. <laughs> so is there anything he can do if he doesn't have a copy of the trust? Well, the first thing, obviously, would be to demand to have a copy of the trust. Demand sounds pretty hard. It, that, that's well, the legal terminology. Right. right. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously, you approach the, the, the beneficiary, I mean, the trustee, trustee and let him know, okay, this is, you know, what is going on, where's the information I should have. I'm entitled to have copies of the trust if I'm a beneficiary, where is it, and what's the next steps. Uh, you know, if that doesn't, you know, what one time, you know, sometimes I had to deal with this when the trustee doesn't act just on that friendly conversation, then you do sometimes can hire a lawyer and send a letter explain to a trustee that they have, these are their duties and they have to provide the information. Of course, ultimately, the, other, the only other option if the trustee does not respond with uh, at this time is to take the trustee to court. The trustee can be personally liable uh, for failure to carry out his fiduciary or her fiduciary duties. So it's something that's really serious there. Absolutely. And that's also, uh, that could also be in a will, right, with an executor? Yeah, and ex an executor is a little different because the executor is being supervised by the court. So there's less opportunity to hide things uh, and keep things away from the beneficiaries. Hmm. So in, in, interesting thing there, they have to write a letter, probably certify it, right? And then and then have an attorney. So it kind of, there's a way you to escalate. escalate yeah. Right, right. So... Uh, good question, Jeff, and I hope you get some resolution there. And if you need help with that or any help with your estate plan, feel free to reach out at 833-888-HOUR for our, or that's 833-888-4687, or go to the website, retirehour.com, or go to Gerald's website, Eidelman Law Firm, and hopefully you get some resolution here soon, Jeff, because I can, I, I can just see from tax reasons, which uh, you know we focus on a lot here, that you need to probably have some information on that before the end of the year. Well, stay tuned because we'll be right back with our final segment with Joshua Sikora, lead CPA of Market Tax Services. And we're going to explore more about this topic we talked about earlier in the show. What is a backdoor Roth? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour, the show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement. We have a whole team here, our financial advisory group, our tax team, our estate planning team, and our Medicare group. And they're all here as resources to help you navigate this and work together at the same conference table, which I like to point that out because oftentimes you'll hear people out there say, well, I have someone I can refer you to. Doesn't, doesn't really be beneficial when you're not in the same room. And you and, and Larry, uh, Joshua, were working with some people actually no, it was you and Danny yeah, that, right, that's yeah. the story sorry yep, yep. Um, but the this backdoor Roth conversion is a really mm, I, I can't remember how Larry described it but it's, it's a sticky wicket and if you if you don't have the team working in-house together collaborating it can catch people off guard you've got a story about that yeah absolutely so we um, we were working with the client now and before he ever came to us he tried doing a, a back to our Roth conversion and it, it sounds like a simple idea, right? You make a contribution to your traditional IRA. You don't take a deduction for it. And then you basically roll it over to your Roth, no taxes, easy peasy, right? But there's this nasty thing that comes in called a pro rata rule. 
And that goes in and it says the IRS doesn't care if you have this IRA, that IRA and another IRA, all traditional. They view the whole thing as a single, a single entity, basically a single account. They, they don't care that you've got different bank accounts going on essentially. And so when you take a distribution out of your IRA, you don't get to pick and choose which dollars it is you take out. You have to take them out equally. So if in your account, two thirds of it is pre-tax contributions and a third is after tax non-deducted contributions, you don't get to select that nice one third that's after tax. You have to take a third or two thirds out of your pre-tax traditional side and then a third after your after tax traditional side. And so unless you have nice clean IRAs where it's all done after tax, you don't have these lingering balances going on. When you go to try to do a backdoor Roth without, without working with a team like us, where we can talk to, to the financial and the tax advising side at the same time, then you get a very unpleasant consequence when you go to file your taxes and you see what you thought was this tax-free backdoor Roth conversion is actually costing you a healthy chunk in, in taxes you weren't anticipating. So my producer is talking to me in my ear. Congratulations. I think everyone has just called in and said, you've lost everybody. Yeah, I'm sure. So, I'm sure. It's complicated. I mean, it is, so it, it complicated. is complicated. And it's, it's something that's, that's tough to get into. Even, even just sitting down with somebody in the conference room, because trying to follow that bouncing ball from here to here and you take a third and then, or whatever that percentage is, and then you go back, it, it's complicated. Um, and in, in this particular situation, the, the client had a financial advisors he was working with that was advising him to go into this transaction, but he didn't have a tax advisor sitting at the table at the same time saying, okay, well, we can do that, but then here's the unintended consequences of that decision. So I think it was a financial advisor or something, blah, 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 Jones. They're on every corner or something like that. Uh-huh. And, and, and yeah, they're great. Sure. Investments, they're, they're helping him with his investment, mm-hmm. but there's a tax component here. And I don't, I don't know about you, but. I don't want to get my brain surgery advice from the guy that mows my lawn. I want to make sure that I'm getting the tax advice from a tax advisor, a licensed tax advisor, Mm -hmm. because you and I can spend the whole hour talking about stories. We've heard from people that their financial advisor gave them tax advice and it bit them. But so this tax advice component is so critical. And do you think it would have been, do you think you could have executed this if you, if he would have came to you and then he went back to the financial advisor or if it's just that complicated where if they're not in the same room, it's just hard to do. I just explained this to you. We talk about taxes routinely. You came back at me with a blank stare. (laughs) So no, no, nothing against whoever we're working with, but these are complicated topics. There are lots of rules going on, lots of technical jargon involved, and it is easy to get yourself sideways unless you can get the people who talk, you know, Greek and French working together <laughs> at the same time. Uh, nothing against the Greek or the French, right? Absolutely <laughs> so not. Just, just difficult languages there. Yep. So, um, you know, we've talked about this first half of the show, all these changes that are proposed in here. And, you know, it's going to change again. Sure. But how critical is it to work with a financial advisor when you're helping a tax client? Uh, that you're in the same room with. I mean, that it, it's it's very hard to pass all that information back and forth and trust that the, the person you're working with gets it back to their professional to execute it. Absolutely. It is. It's tough. Um, you know, before we, we started working together, I would work with clients and I would tell them things that they needed to do. And often I was met with that same blank stare that, that you, you shared with me. And, and it's just tough. Not that anything is is wrong with trying to do it separate, but you're missing out on a lot. It's on, you have a lot of responsibility as the, the client, the taxpayer of trying to make all these pieces work together. And I see it all the time when you or any of your team are working with us in the conference room, specifically right now with Roth conversion season, we call Mm -hmm. it that Sure, we're working on doing these before the end of the close of the tax year. You, you and I both are you and uh, uh, Hannah or whoever we're working with Mm -hmm. the, the information that we share, well, don't forget about this. And did you remember about that and this, and we're plugging on all that information. And if it, if something gets missed, it does have a ripple effect. Absolutely. Uh, we talk all the time, whenever we talk about tax planning, about unintended consequences, and we need to walk all the way around a decision before we make it to make sure that we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if we might choose to do something or not do something based on a consequence, but if you don't know what that consequence is, 
you can't make that choice. And oftentimes market advisor group, when we have the advisor, uh, when we have the investment advisory client, we pick up the tab for all the tax planning with you guys, which makes it easy on my billing department. <laughs> it does. So if you guys want to talk about how this team approach could be beneficial for you, feel free to reach out to us. 833-888-HOUR. That's 833-888-4687. Or go to our website, retirehour.com. Look at past episodes, check us out, or book your consultation right there on the website. Well, that's all the time we have for this week on Retire Hour. We appreciate you guys tuning in to this week's episode. We'll see you next week. and opinions expressed in this program do not represent financial, medical, tax, or legal advice. Please consult with a competent professional to provide advice tailored to your needs and circumstances. Investment advisory services are offered through Foundations Investment Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor.